Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Dr. Karen Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. For a while now, I've wanted to address the question that I get a lot from listeners and from those who follow me on social media, and it's really complex and hard to answer. And the question is, how do I learn to love myself more? Because we hear a lot that the first step to having a great relationship with a romantic partner, with your friends, with your family, that the very first step you have to take is to love yourself. But at the same time, it's a really hard thing to do because it's nebulous. It's, it's hard to concretize the notion of loving yourself, especially if you feel that it's something that you've struggled to do for your whole life. Maybe your parents didn't really model self-love of themselves, so you didn't have that to look to as an example. Or maybe they weren't kind and loving to you in your childhood. So you don't have that sense of worth and belief that you matter. When people are struggling with self-love, which I think we all do from time to time, we're human. We have those really dark times. We have those really dark moments. But when people are struggling on a daily basis with feeling okay about themselves, it's really easy to say, well, just learn to love yourself more, but really hard to provide practical strategies for doing so, which is why I've been very eager to devote an entire podcast episode to this topic. And joining us for the conversation is author Catherine Baldwin, who shares her own journey to self-love and provides not only her personal story, but also some practical steps we all can take to learn to love ourselves more. Catherine Baldwin is a writer, journalist, coach, and speaker. She writes and speaks about her journey of transformation and coaches others to break unhealthy patterns, find love, and live wholeheartedly. She is a former Reuters correspondent whose freelance work has been published in Red, Psychologies, and The Guardian. Catherine, welcome to the program. Hi, Karen. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining me today. This topic that I want to address with our listeners is such an important one and one that I get a lot of questions about, how to truly love yourself. So I thought this would be a great kind of touchstone for us to discuss with uh, with listeners about how we can go about this very kind of fuzzy notion of self-love. Yeah, thanks, Karen. So my book is it's called How to Fall in Love, and it is my journey of how I eventually found a relationship in my early 40s and committed to my now fiancé. But at the core of it is my own journey to learning to love myself after many years of not loving myself. You know, when I say that I didn't love myself, I it was quite extreme in that I actively harmed myself. I was binge eating, I had an eating disorder, I was compulsively exercising, I was working myself into the ground, I wasn't resting, I wasn't having downtime, I was drinking too much alcohol, I was getting myself into relationships with men that weren't good for me. So I was, yeah, I was harming myself in so many ways. So this story, this idea of self-love is so important to me because I had to build really solid foundations of self-love and self-care way before I was able to have a healthy and loving relationship with somebody else. It was really crucial. Help my listeners understand your background because you're admitting now that the self-love was not there. And in fact, the self-abuse was there. But on the surface, you had this glamorous life with international travel and business. I mean, on the surface, you looked like you had it all. That's right. I did. On the outside, it looked really good. Um, I was a competent, confident professional journalist. I you know, I was a, a foreign correspondent. I worked in Brazil and in Mexico. It was a very glamorous life, uh, lots of parties, lots of travel. 
And then I worked in the Houses of Parliament in, in Britain. And I traveled with the prime minister and with ministers all over the world. I asked questions of the prime minister in press conferences. I went to 10 Downing Street and, you know, I dressed in nice clothes and I looked good as well. Even though I was binge eating and starving, I kept on top of my weight, compulsive exercising. So I looked good. So on the outside, um, nobody had any idea really of the turmoil and the mess that was going on on, on the inside of the low self-esteem, the low self-worth, the self-doubt the imposter syndrome, the not feeling good enough, and then the the harming myself by using these crutches like food, alcohol, uh, achievement, men, to try and feel better about myself. There was a real contrast between my outsides and my insides, and that's something I talk about and write about because I think it's really important to be authentic and to match our insides with our outsides. I love that, and I love that you're just very vulnerable in sharing that because so many of the women that I'm interacting with on social media, they have great high-powered careers, and they have so much success in all these other realms of their lives, and they keep going, but why is this one portion of my life such a struggle? So I love that you're sharing your heart and sharing just, just the reality that when the outside doesn't match the inside, really true love won't happen. I mean, you might get into a relationship, but as as we talk about in marital therapy, water rises to its own level. So we've talked about low self-esteem, self-abuse, self-harm. If that's what's going on with you on a psychological and emotional level, then that is what you are going to attract and seek out and find. Not consciously, of course. No one's going to say, hey, I'm psychologically damaged. Let me find someone else who's psychologically damaged. No one does that intentionally, but that's what happens. There's no other way around it because, and again, getting back to the water analysis, Analogy, it's as if we have this U-shaped pipe, and if we pour water into it, when the water stops, it will level off, and you won't have one side of the pipe higher than the other. And that's a, a nice analogy to understand. We can only attract to us the type of emotional health that we have within ourselves. That's so true, Karen, and you know, it reminds me very much of my journey. And understanding that if I didn't love and value myself, I was going to attract people who didn't love or value me. I was going to accept less than I deserved. Um, and the other really crucial thing that I learned that I talk about, which is relevant to what you've just said, is that I didn't realize that I was afraid of commitment, afraid of intimacy, afraid of deep relationship because I was scared of getting hurt. As you say, we, we act out these behaviors, but we don't really know what's going on in the subconscious. And I was actively seeking men who were afraid of commitment, afraid of intimacy, unavailable, because I hadn't done the work on myself, because I was actually unavailable too, because I was scared of commitment. And that came, that, that began you know, those wounds, that fear was lodged in my mind in my childhood when my experience uh, with my dad, when I was about seven or eight years old, he sat me on his knee and he told me he was moving out and that broke my heart. And deep down, I decided that that experience of love and, and closeness was so painful that I would never want to repeat that again. And I acted out this scenario for years of, of being drawn to men because I really wanted to be loved and to fill that void, and to heal that wound. But whenever I got close, I got scared. So I would push them away, or I would seek out men who weren't available for commitment either, because it was easier that way. I wouldn't have to commit. So I attracted people who were like me, at the same level of development, at the same level of openness to commitment. And I had to understand that I had to do my own work first, build my own solid foundations. And you speak to this so beautifully in the book, and you give some real tangible examples from your own personal life, and then you give some brass tacks, some steps, and some tools that readers can take away. Because again, as I, as I said earlier, these kinds of conversations, like you said, they're out of the, of the realm of our awareness so often. We don't recognize that our behaviors are a reflection of our inner state that isn't healthy and solid where it needs to be. So I want to touch back on self-esteem, which you brought up earlier. And you talked about 
in, in the book, you talked about the pitfalls of looking to others to affirm us. And so in the midst of you pulling back from uh, 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 from love because of fear of being hurt and abandoned again, you were also then grappling with your self-esteem. And, and I love this quote that you say that helped you really start concretizing what self-esteem is. And you said, self-esteem comes from doing esteemable things. Yes, I really love that mantra. It's become a mantra of mine. Self-esteem comes from doing esteemable things. So obviously the things that I was doing before, uh, binge eating, drinking too much alcohol, getting myself into trouble in with men who, who you know, with the bad guys, the men who weren't good for me, um, working too hard, not having any balance or boundaries in my life, all those things weren't esteemable. I wasn't being kind to myself. So I had to start learning how to be kind to myself and how to esteem myself through the behaviors, through the actions. So for me, that was, you know, letting go, learning to heal from my eating disorder, stop, stopping the binge eating, understanding that I was trying to numb my feelings. So learn to process my feelings in healthy ways. And for me, that, that began with sitting still rather than running away. Just being still for a while enabled me to connect to my feelings and process my feelings. And that was really important. And, you know, there's lots of other tools that I suggest in my book, um, journaling, um, you know, writing down our thoughts and our feelings. And, you know, you mentioned that you, you know, that some of the people who you speak to on social media are very high achieving women. And I have a amongst my clients as well, women who are very high achieving and like me struggle to sit still, always on the move, always climbing, always running, always working, always busy. And one of the first things that we try and work on is sitting still and connecting to our feelings. For me, it was about understanding how I feel in myself so that I could then understand how I felt in relationship. Not what I thought about relationship or what I thought about this man I was with, but what I feel when I'm with him. I also talk about finding, you know, finding something greater than yourself. It could be your higher self or it could be it could be the universe, nature, God, you know, whatever you choose. Find something greater than yourself to bring in an element of spirituality into your life. And spirituality can be as simple as as the word peace about finding peace. So finding peace with ourselves, that is um, important. That was important to me. Everything you said, I yes, I echo and I completely agree. I think there's no substitute for a spiritual realm. And it's something that I don't talk a lot about because I know it can alienate some listeners and I don't want to do that. But I know that as I was going through my journey and those dry spells and those times when I thought, gosh, am I ever going to meet the one? I really had to rest in my faith and that bigger entity out there. So believing in God and knowing that he was out there and he cared more about what I was going through than I could even possibly imagine. And that really grounded me. And it reminds me of another topic you bring up in the book. You, you talk about the dangers of being in deficit, which I think is a really crucial element. And then linking it back to spirituality, our spirituality can ground us and provide us with that, the, with the sustenance, what we need to fill that void that otherwise, if we don't have that spiritual realm or that faith, we are like an open wound. And we're looking to others to fill a void that really no one can fill. It really has to come from God and yourself. But if you're operating in a, a state of deficit, it's it's a it's a period in your life when you're horribly vulnerable to just trying to fill, fill, fill with anything or anyone. And you mentioned, uh, uh, and I would like you, if you don't mind, share the the story about when your father passed away. If I remember correctly from the book, there was some tension with your stepmother and you were very, very obviously you're grieving. I mean, this is a horrific loss. And then you had a man and I think he was American and you thought, yes, I'm going to move to America and this will be my next chapter. Yeah. When my dad died, um, there was not only the grief, huge grief for many reasons, because it had been a complex relationship. And then the, I was having difficulty with my stepmom and I really needed a lot of support and um, I didn't really realize how 
how sad and how lost I was. And but I did meet a man. He was actually British, but he was moving to Washington, and um, so I was dating him, and he was living in Washington. And I remember feeling so unhappy with my life in London, and so lost and so unsure what to do next that I thought, I know, I'll move in with him in Washington, and it was going to be the answer to my troubles. But actually, I. I hadn't thought through my life. That was me finding, trying to find someone else to fix me. And as, as we know, that doesn't work. We can't get other people to fix us. We have to find a way to fix ourselves internally from the inside out, uh, to heal rather than fix, actually, to heal ourselves. So fortunately, the man in question, um, when I suggested that I moved in with him, he didn't think it was a good idea. And he suggested that I, I be more, that I create something for myself, even if that did mean moving to the States, but that I did under my own steam. I took that as rejection, relationship ended, but it was probably the best thing that happened because it enabled me to grieve again. So that relationship had been a sticking plaster. It had enabled me to cover over the wound for a year while I dated someone. And then when it ended, the floodgates opened I really grieved and I felt really empty and lost. And I felt actually there's a part in my book where I I'm wondering what the point is. I'm so lost and lonely and empty inside that I'm wondering what the point of my life is. And then I I choose to try and climb out, climb back up, use whatever I can to to feel better. So that so that hole that was in deficit to fill that with kindness, kindness to myself. Um, You know, I was talking about this with a client today, being kind to ourselves. It doesn't come easy to all of us. It really doesn't. No, it doesn't come easy at all. And I was thinking about, I was just reading a book um, that was looking at some of the psych research. And there's all sorts of studies that look at the messages that we tell ourselves. We can be our worst critic. People who are actually really thriving in life, they're critical of themselves objectively just like, oh yeah, I could have done better next time or, and so forth. But they also have a lot of grace and give themselves a lot of breaks because I think some of us think, well, if I'm not hard on myself, then I won't be a high achiever anymore. (laughs) But actually the literature shows the opposite, that we are better at achieving and, and we achieve more when we give ourselves just a little grace. Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. I'd love to connect with you on social media. On Instagram, I'm at Dr. Karen. Dr. K-A-R-I-N. Here I share my thoughts on love and life through original quotes and images. I'd love to have you join the conversation. On Twitter, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson. You can find me live tweeting my favorite shows, This Is Us, Will and Grace, and My Guilty Pleasure. All shows Bachelor Nation. On Facebook, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. There you can read my blog, see where I'm speaking, and find links to others' podcasts when I'm a guest on their show. One of the things that you talked about also in the book that really struck me was as you were trying to crawl out of this well of of grief, you did consider and you tried for a time some antidepressants, which is, of course, a very common occurrence now. In America, at least, there's a, a pretty big push in this direction. And as a psychologist, I I'm quite worried that that is the first course of action oftentimes, but I was struck that you didn't really like how you felt, and then you found that the void you were trying to fill with, in this case, the the Prozac, really you needed to go and connect with nature and that spending time getting away and really just connecting to that essence, that nature was really much more therapeutic for you than the pharmaceuticals. Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion and it was an interesting time of my life. Um, So I did, uh, I had been debating in my head for a number of years on and off about antidepressants because I had been up and down emotionally and I was wary. I had been seeking for years these artificial highs. Um, I'd been seeking to change how I felt with substances and so I was wary of trying that with, with antidepressants. But there came a time when I thought I've resisted enough, I need some help. And I did go and get some and I took half a pill and I felt a bit fuzzy headed. And I know that I knew that was part of the process and I just needed to wait until I got used to it. Uh, I took a half a pill the next day and again, I felt fuzzy and I went for a walk and I was so torn about whether to continue taking these antidepressants. And I started to look at my life and I started to realize that I was making myself miserable. 
through the choices that I was making. I had left my very high stress uh, job as a political reporter in Parliament. However, I was still doing work that didn't fulfill me, that didn't make my heart sing. So I thought, how, how about I try and be kinder to myself and create a different life for myself to see if I can do life without the pills? Because I felt like I would be medicating myself to maintain the, the miserable life that I had created. And I remember one day um, a work meeting got cancelled. I was in London and the sun was out and I thought, I'm going to the beach. So I just went to the train station, got on a train for about an hour, went to the beach on my own. And I was so happy that day. I was in my element. I was on the sand, in the sun, in the sea. I was reading. And I thought, I left that day and I thought, Catherine, you know exactly how to make yourself happy. It's the choices that you are making. And if I continue to make those choices, I would need antidepressants to keep afloat. But if I made different choices, maybe I wouldn't need them. So I vowed to myself that I would make different choices and try and do without the drugs. And that's what's happened. I haven't returned to them. I I didn't take any more. And everything's changed. I've changed my career. I've moved out of London. I'm engaged. I live by the sea. And I'm not saying I, I'm sorted. I still struggle with being hard on myself and overworking. And But largely, you know, it has been a transformation. And uh, I'm pleased that I realized that I was making myself miserable. And you took the power back by looking at your choices. Because there are a lot of things in life we can't control. But we can control these day-to-day choices whether it's our mindset, whether it's our behaviors, whether it's giving ourselves a little bit of a break and going and spending some time at the beach, these behaviors and these choices that we make are huge. They're little in and of themselves, but they add up to completely change our lives. And that's why I loved that story and I wanted to just share it with my listeners. And it also reminds me what you just shared reminds me of another quote you talk about. You say, becoming whole is a lifelong journey. And I like this because sometimes, like, I have a lot of quotes that I put on Instagram, things like, happy marriages are made up of two people who are perfectly happy alone. And then I think sometimes people have a little pushback on that. They think, well, I'm not perfectly happy, so does that mean I'm never going to be happily married? And that's not what I'm suggesting. But I am saying, as we've talked about throughout this conversation, that when I'm coming from a place of deficit or I have a void that I'm hoping my relationship will fill, that's not sustainable for a healthy relationship that will actually help both partners thrive. But what I am saying is that, of course, it's a lifelong journey. None of us is perfected. Of course. I mean, that, that's that's absurd. But ultimately, we are going to receive and attract and have in our lives the same level of work that we've done. Obviously, in relationships, we are doing our healing all the time. And I remember when I heard the expression that our hurt happens in our relation in relationships. So our healing happens in relationships too. So as we are in our relationships, we are still doing our healing and we're healing at a really profound level as well. But if we enter the relationship in deficit, looking for the other person to change us, fix us, make us happy, then we're standing on really, really shaky ground. So it's about getting to a level of self-awareness and it's about how I feel when I'm with him, rather than what I think about him, rather than who I think I need to be with. It's about how I feel when I'm with him. And um, when I'm with him, I feel exactly how I want to feel. You know, I feel like I could stay here forever. I feel content and happy and at peace. And, you know, as you can probably hear from my story, I'm not traditionally a person who has felt peace. So um, feeling at peace in my relationship is amazing. Yeah. And and I think that's so much of what it is that we're looking for. And it's hard to put a finger on it, but I think peace is a really good way of looking at it. This quarter, Love and Life lends a hand to 11th Candle Company. All proceeds from the sale of my book, Single is the New Black, Don't Wear White Till It's Right, will go to 11th Candle Company's Legacy Foundation. To hear more about the incredible work Amber Runyon is doing to help women escape sex trafficking, please take a listen to my podcast interview with her. 
It's episode 42. How does a candle company combat human trafficking? 11th Candle Company. Check them out at 11thcandleco.com and be sure to use promo code Take Charge to receive 20% off your entire purchase. I want to talk about the scripts that you mention in your book. So the scripts that you mentioned, you had to basically rewrite because you recognize that some of the thoughts that were going through your head were, well, I'm getting too old now. My body isn't the way it should be. And so I'm not desirable. And you mentioned some others. And these are really powerful messages that if we don't keep them in check, they completely taint the way we view ourselves and how we expect to be treated by others. Yes. And it relates to what we were just talking about. If we go into a relationship having low self-esteem and feeling that I'm too fat or I'm too old or I'm not good enough, we're on the back foot when we start out. We're always going to be looking to the other person to try and help us reverse those statements. And that is too much to ask of somebody else. And it means we are very fragile and vulnerable to other people's perceptions and and opinions about us. And the key is to try and reverse those core beliefs ourselves before we enter into relationship. What I always say is we can change how we how we think about ourselves through our actions towards ourselves. So it's about building up our our inner resources. It all comes from the inside. And we can do the outside stuff as well if it feels if it feels good. You know, we can pamper, we can do our hair, we can dress well and all those things whatever it takes to um but without judging ourselves on or comparing ourselves I always say compare and despair so um, yeah yeah it's one of my favorite quotes is by Theodora Roosevelt comparison is the thief of joy Mm. and just one other thought about what you just shared you know there's a ton of psych research so my psych nerd is going to come out here but there's a ton of psych research that talks about even behavioral changes like standing up straight, smiling. And so these things that you're talking about, so pampering, yes, that too, but you know, fake it till you make it is a thing (laughs) and it actually works. So sometimes you're not going to feel that you love yourself so much. You're just going to wake up and be like, I don't really feel like I love myself. Be that as it may, Start doing esteemable things, right? So that you can build your self-esteem. I mean, the psych research on self-esteem is pretty simple. You set a goal and reach it. So I'm going to act and behave as if, and that's another psych technique from therapy. What would you do if you Mm. did love yourself today? Yeah. Just do that. Imagine, well, someone who loved themselves might, I guess, make my bed because I want my room to look put together when I come back to my bed this evening. Someone who loved themselves might actually take a shower and put on a little makeup and, and, a, and a halfway cute outfit, even if I'm just going to the grocery store. You know, these sorts of things seem very trite and simple, but the research suggests they're not. They actually make a difference. We can kind of step into that identity. We don't have to have the feelings first and then behave. We can behave and let the feelings follow. That's a great suggestion. And I loved what you said earlier about, you know, standing tall, dressing in a way that you feel attractive. It's not about impressing anyone else. How do you, do you feel good when you leave the house? Um, Do you walk, walk out with a skip in your step? Right. Because you're sending out energy, but that energy is what people are picking up on. And it's not tangible, but it's real. Someone walks in a room and you get a vibe off this person. And so they're communicating to you even before you've had a conversation verbally. So these are very important tools and and they make a huge difference. So Catherine, just to wrap up, uh, I guess, do you have any parting thoughts? Getting back to our initial question, I know you've shared a lot of tools and strategies. And again, I want to reiterate the name of your book is How to Fall in Love, A 10-Step Journey to the Heart. And in the book, you share so much of your journey and you do give some real brass tacks because I know I'm a psychologist. I like theory. I can talk about theories all day long, but, but, but listeners are looking for what can I do? So do you have any parting thoughts for someone who really wants to dig deep and learn to love themselves? So we've talked about some really important elements um, on this journey to self-love. And there's another mantra that I, I use, which is that we teach people how to treat us. 
So we show people how to treat us by the way we treat ourselves. And when people see that we are taking care of ourselves, then they'll respect us and value us too. And so we teach people how to treat us, really honoring yourself. I love that word. Mm. How can you honor yourself so that somebody will want to honor you? Beautifully stated. Thank you so much for leaving my listeners with that. Catherine, also, where can they buy the book? Where can they find you if they want to connect with you further? A website, social media, just let everyone know how to get a hold of you. Thank you. So yes, the book is called How to Fall in Love, A 10-Step Journey to the Heart. And it is on Amazon. And uh, you can also go to my website, which is uh, How to Fall in Love dot co dot uk and you'll see about the book and about courses and retreats and so forth um i also have katherine dot com and then there's my uh yeah twitter is from 40 with love four zero and my instagram is katherine dot baldwin and you can find me on facebook too thank you so much katherine thank you so the love and life hack for this week is act as if we're borrowing from adlerian therapy here and going about things a little differently. Instead of waiting for the feeling to act, act as if you had the feeling already. Act as if you felt that self-love. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Thanks for joining me today. And until next time, make it a great week. Dr. Karen Love and Life is produced by Chip Gregory, senior producer Michelle Musso, and host and executive producer Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. <laughs>